Okay, hello. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to be able to start the second session of um, the symposium. And um, I would like to introduce um, Amin Shokrolahi, um, who worked with David on coding, on codes. So I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this was probably the best pronunciation of my last name by someone who's not Iranian. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> it's a real great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, it's also a pleasure to talk about something I've been doing in the last, oh god, six years now, which is uh, it's a bit of a problem. Um, this is a work that I started doing when I uh, was a professor at EPFL. I still am a professor at EPFL, but I took some time off to start a company called Kandubas. So uh, what's the issue? The issue is uh, something that you use every day. You, know, you have two chips that need to communicate with one another through wires, electrical signaling between two chips. Now, you have it in every device that you're using today. You have it in these laptops. You have it in your cell phones. You, um, you use that whenever you do a search. So any data center will have that. Any, um, you know, any, any high-speed electronic device uh, is doing this kind of communication. So it's, uh, it's, the, the task is simply stated. You want to replicate information that you have on one chip and on another. That's it. So again, we see them everywhere. So smart TVs, uh, uh, cameras, uh, you know, glass, so uh, like Google Glass or data centers or whatnot. So um, it is a, an important enough problem. So the issue really is that when you communicate information, even though you're communicating information across a very small distance, you know, that can be even a millimeter sometimes, and sometimes it can be up to a meter, but not much more, you will have a lot of noise on these channels. And, uh, so, um, and the problem with the noise is that it's kind of frequency selective, meaning um, you know, if you want to send more data on these wires, what you typically do is you run a clock faster by that much. So you sample faster and faster and faster. And the problem is that the noise increases in, in a very disproportional way with the frequency. So if uh, you have 40 dB noise on some frequency, then maybe if you go to double the frequency, you go to 90 dB noise, which is essentially useless data. You cannot really do anything with the data. Now, I want to show you something uh, that I find, I personally find very um, interesting, which is how much energy, how much power does, do these, this, does this type of communication consume? And you know, it's quite amazing. If you look at traffic generated inside a supercomputer. I'm just talking inside the computer. So, you know, sending data from one processor to another and so on. And you look at, let's say, 10,000 supercomputers worldwide. You know, in terms of gigabits per second, you get that number. So I guess it's peta, 1 to the 10 to the power of, uh, power of 12 gigabits per second. And if you, uh, if you, if you look at state-of-the-art ways today, of transmitting that information, you come to a staggering 20 gigawatts of power. Now, these, uh, uh, these machines, they run basically 24 seven. So multiply this 20 gigawatts with whatever time you want to have, it's 24 seven. It's a huge amount of power. If you look at data centers, and this is very, very, um, very optimistic in terms of uh, energy usage, um, you get to maybe eight, um, Eight gigawatt, but it typically it's actually much more. Now the problem is the way we our lives depend on digital data, right? You know, we we we, we browse the web, we we download the data, we take pictures, whatnot, right? And there is in fact uh, a lot of uh, study. There are, there are a lot of studies about how much does this data increase over time, and we look at something like factor of two every 18 months to two years, depending on who you ask. So, which means you have to sort of multiply this amount by a factor of two, basically every two years. And the way, again, things are going, the power is not just multiplied by two, unfortunately. 
is actually multiplied by a larger number, maybe four, maybe even more, more than that. So you know, you, you run into this power bottleneck. All right, so information theory is of course one of the topics and fields that uh, David has worked in. The many, many, many ones. Information theory is one. So typically when um, uh, you, you think about these things, you think about, well, what does information theor theory tell us, right? You are communicating across a channel with noise. How much is the capacity of that channel? How much can you, how much data can you send? Now, the issue is that information theory as it is, is kind of useless here um, to some extent. And I can, I can go into the, um, into, the, into the reasons why. But the, I think the message to take home is even if you used um, the kind of uh, um, infrastructure used today, you should be able to transmit data 20 times, you should be able to send data 20 times faster, 20 times more. So there is, we are actually extremely wasteful in the way we are transmitting this data. And now, you saw the power numbers I gave you, and uh, being wasteful really means you are really throwing out energy out the window, essentially. So can we do something better? Now, you know, a, a number of people here in the audience know, of course, information theory, what, what it has done. Information theory lies at the core of uh, wireless transmission, for example. It lies at the core of DSL. Um, or, or magnetic uh, disk drives. Now, the issue is that the channels we see in chip-to-chip -chip communication is none of that. It's neither a wireless channel, nor uh, a DSL channel, nor a magnetic drive channel. In fact, all, most of these channels suffer from what is called random noise, the noise that you cannot predict beforehand. You have some statistics about the noise, but you can't predict it. In chip-to-chip, -chip, you have a very different situation. In fact, if you sort of lump the various noise types together, almost 99% of it is deterministic. You actually know about that noise beforehand. Before you send the data, you know exactly, exactly how the data is going to be distorted when it reaches the other side. So you tell that to any information theorist, and they say, well, the channel is kind of trivial then. Capacity is kind of infinite, right? That's the, uh, that's the situation. However, there is one important, super important condition that has to be met. <laughs> Namely, the resources that you need in order to be able to discern the bin. The resources in the chip-to-chip -chip world are extremely tight. Really, the tightest you have, I have at least, ever seen in any communication world. I call it the rule of thousands. If you look at wireless transmission, what you have is you, uh, the, the transmission is about 1,000 times faster in a chip-to-chip -chip warp. The power or the energy that you use per transmitted bit is measured in nanojoules in wireless world, whereas in picojoules in chip-to-chip -chip world. And the recovery time, so how much time do you have to discern a bit, is measured in nanoseconds in a wireless world and in picoseconds in a chip-to-chip -chip world. So you have very little time to discern the bits, and you have very little energy to do that. So how on earth can you? Now, because you, you ascend, you know, actually it's a, it's a philosophical thing. What does randomness really mean? You know, randomness essentially tells you something about your capability of computing. If you could compute things to a very, very high amount of precision, then basically you would have very little randomness or none. So, and, and you know, theoretical computer science gives a very clear theory about this. Randomness is always with respect to your computational model. So you see it here. You don't have the computational power that you would have in a wireless world. Therefore, even though the channels are not random, you have to regard them as random. Because you just don't have any time or money, in this case energy, to invert it. All right, so nevertheless, when you start sort of looking into this, you really need to understand what kind of noise you see on these wires. And there are many different noise types. And uh, you know, one of them is, for example, if you have wires that are communicating the information, there are some nearby wires that, uh, that increase or decrease the voltage levels on these wires simultaneously. It's called common mode noise. 
uh, there is crosstalk. So you have wires, you put you know, voltage on one of the wires, it affects the nearby wires. It's called crosstalk. Um, there is electromagnetic interference, maybe by some other wires nearby. There is uh, uh, thermal noise. And there is one noise type that in this world is just the main culprit, the worst one. It's called intersimal interference, and I will get to that in a minute. So because you cannot really invest in an infrastructure to recover from noise, maybe the best way to do is to transmit the information in such a way that you already have inherent reliability or inherent uh, resilience to these noise types so that you don't have to do much cleanup at the end. And so people have, and you know, electrical engineers here will probably immediately see what this is. People have been doing this kind of stuff for years, for decades, called differential signaling. What they do is they transmit one bit across two wires. So if you think of bits being transmitted as plus one and minus one, then you send either a plus one and a minus one on the two wires or a minus one and a plus one on the two wires. And then there is an electronic circuit that's called a comparator. And this comparator, essentially what it does, it takes a difference of the wire values and determines its sign in a very, with, a, with a very efficient circuit. So you have two wires, one bit smeared over two wires, and one comparator to detect that bit. Now, you're using two wires to transmit one bit. And therein lies the big problem of this uh, sort of uh, power increase as you increase the frequency. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this is the bread and butter of all high-speed links anywhere. Your cell phone is using it. I mean, this device here is using, I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of those, uh, of those links. So the geometric way of looking at the uh, at differential signaling is by looking at whatever you put on the wires as points. These are two-dimensional points, plus one, minus one, and minus one, plus one. The sum of these points is zero, so they, they lie on this sort of uh, anti-diagonal. And uh, what you see, the red, is the comparator. Is, so anything that is when you, so you take, if you, if you will, the inner product with a comparator, if you take something that's negative, you get one value. If you get something that's positive, you get another value. So the way I want to define the code is these points in the space and the comparator that distinguishes these two points. That will be my definition of a code. So, you know, then you start sort of looking into it and see what, 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 is, what, is, what makes differential signaling interesting? What is it that, it turns out what makes it interesting is that the sum of the values is zero. One plus minus one is zero. And uh, then there are a bunch of other, other things that I'm not gonna get into. But, you know, you start making a laundry list of all the interesting properties of differential interesting and why they're interesting. Because you want to generalize, so you have to go that, down that path. All right, and uh, you know, I apologize. I didn't quite know what kind of talk I have to give. So there is actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so what's the first attempt? So you know, you know, never mind what's written on this slide. I will just explain it to you. A chordal code really is the following. You take a bunch of points. So let's say you are transmitting information on n wires. n could be two, could be three, could be four. So the code book is the set of allowable values on the wires. So you can think of them as points in the n-dimensional space. So these are your code words. And the dual to that are the comparators. Comparators are just hyperplanes separating these points. So you have hyperplanes and you have points. That is really the chordal code. Now you have a bunch of things. You have some of values of, of, the, of the coordinates of a code word should be zero. Uh, then there are some, you know, some, uh, some things about the comparators. But what is really important is that the comparators distinguish the points, meaning that you, know, you cannot have two points that are on the same side of all the comparators. Cannot work. They have to sort of separate the points. And then you define the rate. The rate is really the number of bits you send on these n wires divided by the number of wires. So you know, here is a question that any coding theorist would ask, you know, given the number of wires, given the uh, size of the code, find the smallest number of comparators such that we have such a code. So with these comparators, you can distinguish. 
anyways. So here's an, here is one uh, interesting quote. So you're, you're operating in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the plane, so you have two wires, and now I want to send three bits on these two wires. So I take eight uh, code words, and I can distinguish these eight using four lines. So these are four <laughs> comparators. And these comparators then subdivide my space into eight, spa eight uh, regions. Now, the sum of the values here is not zero. But you know, if I wanted to do that, I had to go to three dimensions, and never mind that. It's, uh, never mind that, really. So if you want to really um, make a practical system out of it, it turns out it's nice if you turn it around a little bit. And if you do, then the comparators get very simple equations. Uh, and you know, the regions are easily described by the sine vectors with respect to these comparators. And you can then do bit loading on these things. Yes, please. Uh, is the noise isotropic? What does that exactly mean? Uh, not, not necessarily. So, so if you look at, first of all, we don't have any random. So, so now I understand what you're saying. We don't have that kind of noise here at all. So think of the noise as intersimilar interference, basically, <laughs> nothing else. And I, I will tell you in a minute what that means. Um, so you know, for those of you interested in electronics, this is what you do. You take an electronic circuit that takes uh, the three bits in and then starts driving the, uh, the, 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 the various uh, voltages or, or currents on the wires using transistors. So you take the three bits in, you create eight bits out of it, and these eight bits are used to, to turn on and off certain transistors. And from that, you can actually get a you know, decent implementation, which, by the way, absolutely will not work in practice. So it, it's nice to put it on a, on a slide. The one that works in practice is much more complicated than this. And once you have received the data, then there are these four comparators you see there. And uh, you, know, you have three bits. The four comparators, however, give you four bits. So you need to somehow make three bits out of it. And in this case, it's very simple. You take the XOR of two of the bits, and that's, uh, that gives you the third bit. And the other two bits are just verbatim given by the comparators. That's called a digital decoder. Now, one of the things that I want to mention, because that goes back to David's work, is um, some of you in this audience will probably have heard of LDPC codes, low density parity check codes. And David has done a, a tremendous amount of fantastic work on this. And he was one of the sort of originators, or uh, again, how do you call it, kickstarters of, of, the, of the field uh, back in the 1990s. And what is really important about the LDPC codes is that they are born with the concept of an efficient algorithm. The algorithm is really in the foreground. The code itself kind of disappears in the background. That is really the most important thing about them. And so the chordal codes have been kind of modeled after that. In a way, the algorithm is in there. These are the, 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 the comparators. The code is born with efficient algorithms. And now the question is, how can we design it in such a way that it actually works in practice? All right, so one of the questions that you might ask is, well, if I, you know, the question was, if I give you um, the, the number of wires and the number of code words, what's the minimum number of comparators? Or in other ways, if I give you the number of wires and the number of comparators, what's the largest code size that I can have? And there is a theorem called Zaslavsky's theorem that goes back to 1974. And this is in the theory of hyperplane arrangements. It's very simple, in fact. This is, this is the formula. There you go. So for example, if you take three wires and uh, you know, two comparators, you get at most four code words, for example. This is just one of the examples. Now, one of the things it says is that the rate of the code can be arbitrarily large, because the capital N really depends only on C. So if you make the number of comparators large enough, then you can also make the number of the size large enough. So in a way, any coding theorist in the audience will say, something is missing. You, you cannot have you know, arbitrarily large um, uh, code sizes. And uh, the reason is there is really some, you know, indeed something missing from the theory. But let's look at some examples. So here is an example of four code words in a three-dimensional space. So very simple, ternary code words. And you look at two comparators. One of them compares 
one, the first coordinate against the second, and the second one compares the first coordinate against the third. And you look at the values they calculate, and uh, you look at their science vectors, and you see that the code, four code words are really um, distinguished. Now, there is something called an eye diagram. Anybody here familiar with eye diagrams? Very, okay, good. So, doesn't matter what it means. What it means is the larger this blue part, the better the signaling scheme. Okay, so just, uh, you know, the, op the more open the eye, the, the better the signaling scheme. And you see that the top eye is, is op more open than the bottom eye. You take the same code words, but now with these two comparators, out of a sudden, the bottom one starts opening up. And there is a reason. There is a re deeper reason for that. So actually a mathematical reason. And the reason has to do with what we call intersimal interference. And so what is intersimal interference? You know, what you do is you send perfectly rectangular pulse shapes on the wires. But uh, for a variety of reasons, this is not what you get. In fact, this nice rectangular pulse shape starts bleeding, bleeding into, into subsequent symbols. Sometimes it even bleeds forward, you know. <laughs> it's kind of not very casual. But uh, anyway, it bleeds into subsequent symbols. And then if you want to make a detection, for example, here, you have to sum, sum up everything. You want it to have something negative, but sometimes it gets positive and you make an error. The, the geometric interpretation of this is this. So suppose that you want to, uh, to detect uh, the, so in a previous uh, uh, timestamp, you, you sent this uh, code word that is you know, denoted by this large circle, and in the next one in the small circle, and the line separating them is, is your comparator. Because you have something that is far away from this line, what it does is pulls that code word towards itself and over the line. That's the problem. And so, this defines the missing link for these codes. It's called the ISI ratio. We call it the ISI ratio. It's the ratio for the intersimal interference. And what it means is, for if you take one of these hyperplanes, you take the ratio of the largest distance from the hyperplane to the smallest distance. If that ratio, ratio is large, you will suffer from intersimal interference. And the worst ratio across all hyperplanes is then your intersymbol, uh, the ISI ratio of the code. So in this case, for example, if you look at the values, which I see is wrong. Okay, so the second, so on the, on the right column, the second one should be minus one, and the next one should be plus two, well, sorry, minus two and plus two. You know, if, <laughs> excuse me, but anyway. Um, if you had calculated it properly, you would see the ISI ratio of two. And I absolutely don't understand how I made this mistake. <laughs> you know, the key concept of the codes, and I make a mistake on that. It's just fantastic. Because actually, so if you go to the other scheme, you see that the ratio is always one in those cases. And that is why you get a, a much more open eye. Now, then you can start sort of looking at ISI ratio. What is this number? You know, what can we do? It turns out the ISI ratio is not necessarily an integer. It's not necessarily a, a rational number. It can be an irrational number. You know, in this setup, for example, it's square root of two plus one. So these are eight points in a circle on, a, um, on the hyperplane sum equals zero. In this setup, it's much more complicated here. Uh, it's the, the golden ratio, one plus square root of five divided by two. So can be anything really. And then you can, you know, I apologize again for this, but um, then you can start defining. Now this is really almost, almost the final definition, and I will not give you the final definition. Don't worry about it. That's way too much more complicated than this. I just decided not to give that. But the, the definition is the following. The, the code that you want to create is given by a bunch of points, hyperplanes separating the points, and ISI ratio i, meaning that for every hyperplane, the ratio of the furthest uh, code word to the closest code word is not going to be larger than i. And that is really the... Um... So you can have you know, some bounds. You know, the ISI ratio is at least one. Um, uh, the number of comparators is at least the number of bits you want to discern. There is an interesting thing about uh, 
you know, the, the, the existence of chordal codes uh, that can transmit n minus one bits on n wires with an ISI ratio of one, which is optimal. And uh, also, you know, whenever I give this talk, one of the first questions I ask is, so how does this asymptotically work? My answer is, you know, I don't really care about asymptotics because I want to build practical systems. Practical systems, I want to have four, five, six wires, not more. There's no way you can push anything. But if you're interested in, a, um, in an asymptotic, then the, really the, the, the best rate you can get is something like log of one plus the ISI ratio, if you're so interested. You know, you can kind of prove this uh, assertion at least the n minus one, you know. So what you do is you take an orthogonal matrix with certain properties and, uh, and from that you can very quickly calculate uh, or, or create a code that has the right ISI ratio and so on and so on. Um, in fact, there's actually neat math in there, which uh, as it turns out is completely useless because uh, you, know, you can't really use that in practice. It's, in practice this is just, uh, but it's a nice thing to prove if you like. All right, so the next question is, what can we do with it? Now we have all this, what can you do with it? And now I have to say, you know, this whole thing didn't come about by us sitting, you know, thinking about these codes and then see what, can, what we can do with it. It actually was done in a turbo fashion, meaning, so, you know, there was a little bit of theory, then there was practice, the engineers tried that, and then they said, well, this part of the theory is not very good, you have to change it. So it went back and forth and back and forth, and at the end came out a theory that is absolutely practical, which is very nice. So here is one possibility. So there is, there is a, um, you know, based on this theory, we have developed something we call a glass wing. Glass wing is one of the more signaling methods. And what it does is something that is kind of weird if you think about it. We, so if you take a big chip, some system on chip, for example, that does, you know, the packet routing or whatnot, you know, that system on chip will become big as you have to deal with more and more data. And as it becomes big, the yield will go down. You have a big chip, there is, you know, a, you know, a dust uh, particle somewhere, you, can, you have to throw out the entire chip. Wouldn't it be nice if you could, you know, subdivide it into smaller pieces and then uh, stitch them together with a very power efficient and fast link? And that's what we do. That's exactly what uh, this glass wing does. So, it, it, you know, it, it, first of all, um, things that used a lot of power because you would have to go off chip and so on can, can, brought, can be brought down. For example, um, if you look at the um, uh, supercomputers and the number that you had, this link can bring it down by a factor of 20, which is enormous if you look at the 20 gigawatt down to one gigawatt. Um, you know, it's, it's quite amazing. It's really, it's like a little virus with lots of, you know, you know, it's such a small thing, but has, you know, an enormous application. So it took us about five years and many, many, many million dollars of somebody's money to, uh, to come up with this to begin with, right? And, uh, you know, if you're interested in the, the kind of coding we use, we use a certain orthogonal matrix that's given up there. Um, so this, this, this kind of link sends five bits over six correlated wires. You know, one of the things that comes up is if you look at differential signaling, it sends one bit over two wires. And this kind of generalization tells you, oh, you can send two bits over three, three bits over four, four bits over five, and so on and so on, without sacrificing the um, resilience to intersimilar interference. What it does is it consumes one picojoule per bit. Now, this is just such a, one pico is 10 to the minus 12. It's, it's, it's absolutely impossible to grasp, right? So one way to, to look at it is the 20 gigawatts that you needed for the supercomputers will come down to one gigawatt. That's what it means. So easy for, <laughs> um, and it really shows the power of math in there, which is very nice. So, you know, we have actually built this chip, you know, it's going to be uh, in products as of 2017. All right, so I'm pretty, uh, that's my last slide. It was very nice that you showed me the three minutes because, uh, so, you know, one of the things, so what is, what, what I wanted to say is that 
communicating data between chips is using more and more power, more and more power. People have been trying to offset that with what's called Moore's Law, which says that uh, you can pack twice as many transistors on the same area um, in an, uh, uh, within two years, which is not true for this kind of communication. Um, the normal operating rules of information theory don't apply because really the processing, which is completely disregarded in information theory, has the main, um, you know, is, is the main culprit in terms of power consumption. So the coil codes are really one step forward towards a coding theory that can uh, make all these things work. And as I said, they will be in products in 2017. All right, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Amin. We have probably time for a few questions. So if there are any questions, um, please um, hold up your hand and we will get to you with a mic because otherwise your questions won't be recorded. Um, I see. Usually I don't get Hi. it. Perhaps it's an obvious question, but what products is this going to be used in? Ah, so this is a networking product. But I, unfortunately, I cannot tell you more about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now also not yet which company that is, but soon, in a few weeks. You, so uh, the, this code doesn't really seem to be coding over time, right? So No, uh, no, that is spatial coding only. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, do, does it make sense to, uh, to no. do that at all, and no. why? The problem is latency. These yeah, things no, are obviously. enormously latency sensitive, these systems that are on chip, because uh, this is the lowest level of communication. Yeah. Any latency you add is going to multiply, so no. So differential wires are normally installed as twisted pairs. Right. What geometry of wires would be most appropriate for your codes? Right. So, so twisted pairs is in a, in a certain application of differential signaling. So for example, if you have uh, Ethernet or something like that, you know, Ethernet cable. Um, so for these codes, you would have, you actually use the theory of braids, braid groups, to, to get the, the, the twisting. But you know, the industry does not embrace that. It's got, so what we do is on PCBs, you don't have any twisting. So we actually use it on PCBs. Any other questions? Okay, so I have a comment. Um, I think it's a wonderful example of how um, coding theory and concerns about energy come together. So it's a I fantastic fit for the symposium. Thank you very, Thank you much, very much indeed. Thank you for the invitation.